Well, welcome every more everybody to a cool 108 degree day. I don't. Th- it doesn't sound that bad, does it? I think I'm going to go for a bike ride. Welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. I want to put you in the know when it comes to car stuff. We've all got cars. We've all got maintenance, and it's overwhelming, I think, to some people, and we want to put you in the know. So today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, Control arm bushings, what do you do with those? Open phones, and are you a cat lover? (laughs) (laughs) I think Matt Matt is a cat lover. I am not a cat guy. You own one, I don't. I'm I'm, I'm hiding from cats. The cat owns me. (laughs) But what we are referring to today is the catalytic converter. And uh, invented in 1975, it is an expensive piece that you don't want to buy. So how to protect your cat so you don't end up buying another cat. And uh, I think everyone's seen that little yellow light. They've gone down. They've had their car checked out. And they told them, oh, it's an emissions thing. Your catalytic converter is bad. And it's a lot of money. Or you went to the emissions test, and uh, the guy that did the test as well might be the catalytic converter. Or I remember I used to have a 76 280Z, and it had it was California emissions. Mm. And it had a red light on the dash that said catalytic converter. And it, if it would overheat or get not the car overheat, but it it would turn on the red the red the light would illuminate if the catalytic converter started to overheat or if the car was running poorly. I, that must have been like the earliest check engine light. Well, in the old days, catalytic converters you did you didn't know they were bad until you failed emissions or the car caught on fire after <laughs> <laughs> that too. They used to the freeway. They used to run pretty hot. You know, the modern catalytic converter is different than it used to be. They used to be a two stage really, and now it's a it's a three part. I guess because now they they uh, clean up uh, nitrous oxide. Is that that's the <laughs> stuff on, you Dave. get at the dentist? Hydro- I failed chemistry <laughs> big time. Hydrocarbons, CO, and NOx are nitrates of oxygen, uh, and, and those are the three uh, gases that we want to keep out of the atmosphere with the emissions. So. Well, it's almost always a weekly email. Hey, I went to the auto shop. They told me I needed a catalytic converter. It's mega expensive. You know, can can I buy a cheaper one or an aftermarket one? We'll get into that. But first, we need to get into why do catalytic, conver- catalytic converters fail? What the heck is it? Well, it's there for emissions. So basically, it's a muffler full of all kinds of precious metals, rodium, platinum, palladium, all kinds he of- He failed of, chemistry, yeah, too. Yeah, I did, too. <laughs> All kinds of stuff, and it's a and it's a honeycomb, like a beehive, just a honeycomb deal with lots of surface area, and the gases are going through there, the the unburned and raw fuel and the pollutants, and then it's converting when it's, it go, passes through that catalytic converter, and it's burning those bad or disposing of whatever you want to call those pollutants and and bad things that, are, that it's used starting, to come out the muffler. It's starting a chemical reaction, and it's it's a catalyst, so it doesn't actually add anything to it from you know from the catalytic converter. It just starts that chemical change in the exhaust going out the tailpipe. So why do they fail? It's this you've pictured this honeycomb. It's it's actually porcelain, right? Mm-hmm. And then that's coated with, with the lots platinum, of precious metal. precious metals. Speaking of precious, they sometimes disappear. Someone steals it out of the parking lot. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about that real quick. That, that's, you know, you hear uh, on the news of the schools and the churches getting their air conditioner stolen and, and the water pipe going into the into the, the building and the guy shut down school for the day. I don't know how many times you get people that call and say, my car sounds like a go-kart or it sounds <laughs> like a race car. And they went and they parked in the morning at work and they come out and it's got this this loud noise, open exhaust, and people will crawl underneath the car and cut the catalytic converter off with the sawzall and uh, and then go take it down to the scrapyard, and they're selling them. I was reading in, in Atlanta they're having a problem uh, recently with uh, people crawling underneath Honda Elements. Dave, that's hey, your car. Back down. I know, huh? Back down. But I, drool when you I haven't that. heard a lot in the Phoenix area lately, but several years ago, 2008, Nine, I did some pieces with uh, the news stations. It was like hot, hot commodity. People were stealing them. I think they've tightened up at the scrapyards now, and they're not accepting. You know, a guy comes in with three catalytic converters, and you know, his teeth are all black, and his <laughs> face is sucked in. Uh, that guy didn't just, uh, you know, 
come across those at work or, or whatever. So, so the, I think they're the, with the police departments working to to cut back on the on the scrapyards buying them. The thefts have gone down. Well, back but, to the precious metal thing. And the emails that we get is, I need a new catalytic converter, and they told me a thousand dollars. They said I could buy an aftermarket one for about two hundred and fifty dollars. But, you know, the trade-off, and do I want an aftermarket one? Do I want an original factory one? You know, what do I want? And my answer is, you know, got to spend the money. Because you can put in the aftermarket one, but the only thing that's different about it is they've cut down on the amount of precious metal in there, so they just simply don't work. They may work for a number of months, but as time goes on, they're they're just going to fail. Well, I would say, here's my take on it. On a 1996 car or... or, um older I, i'd probably consider going with with an aftermarket one depending on the application on a, a obd2 96 and newer and and probably even you know you start getting into the mid early 2000s like toyota for example volkswagen don't waste you your put, money don't even bother it's not usually not going to work um in the way that I understand this, talking with some exhaust manufacturers like Bozell, who makes a lot of exhaust aftermarket, is that there's only a couple people. This is federally mandated. It's an emissions product, uh, emissions control device. There's only a certain amount of people making this load, they call it, that brick that goes into the catalytic converter. So they're somewhat controlled. It's X for, for, an, for this amount. Well, the only way for the aftermarket to make it a little bit cheaper you just don't get as much anymore. It's there's less in it, so you're not you're not saving money. You're buying less. It's kind well, of like when it's they. It's not a little bit cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. And one of the experiences I had is there's a local remanufacturer of all kinds of things. You know, I said remanufacturer, but recycler. You know, computer monitors. They recycle those. Well, one of the big things they do is catalytic converters. And you go into this room and it's it's sealed airtight. And there's this big crushing machine that crushes the old catalytic converters. And all the junk falls into this thing that catches the material. There's a big vacuum system that catches all the dust that comes because it's precious metal. It's down to the troy ounce, whatever that measurement is, $1,400 a troy ounce is what I read for some of this precious metal that's inside the catalytic converter. And they have people come in with these catalytic converters, and they buy them, and they recycle them. And they said, you know, for a factory, factory diesel catalytic converter, we may pay $300 for that thing. There's a ton of precious metal in it. Now someone comes in with well, an that's aftermarket. Diesel. That thing is ginormous. But Huge. let's just take your 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 Toyota. Somebody goes and steals one off of a Toyota, they might get seventy dollars for it, for example. But if you go steal an aftermarket one, five bucks. You could take a brand new one in, right <laughs> off the shelf aftermarket, and they'll give you five dollars for it. So that tells you right there. They're they're a whole lot cheaper. They're not just a little bit cheaper, and uh, you know it's they're they're not going to work. So my my thing is going to be on a late model car. Always go factory. But back to our original point, why do they fail? Other than getting stolen, you know, because I, I steal them. It's been a while. I'm trying to cut back. <laughs> but why do they go bad? Well, they're going to go bad for a number of different reasons. And it's what we talked about. You have what happened to the car and then what caused whatever happened to happen. So on a, on a catalytic converter, the biggest thing is going to be raw fuel going into the exhaust system. This thing's going to get overloaded with fuel. So that's going to happen from maybe a bad oxygen sensor, not tuning the car, is not keeping proper control of the car, not tuning the car well leaky fuel injector something like that engine miss which is all going to create an engine misfire basically uh, you could have a, a egr valve that that's not working and over causing high cylinder temperatures which creates knocks and then is going to overload this this converter with it's going to exercise it too much and and uh load it up with garbage and, 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 so to speak, wear it out, although there are technically no wear parts inside of it. So if I'm that, that person driving around with that yellow check engine light, don't really know what it means, that people told me it wasn't a big deal, the car seems to drive okay, I don't think you want to ignore it anymore. Because of this expensive piece called a catalytic converter, you know, the car may be running lean or running rich, and it still drives and functions okay, but it's taken out this very expensive piece, and that's not going to be an issue till. It's time for emissions. Well, now you got to get the engine running right, for one, and then two, you got to buy a catalytic converter. And these things sometimes I've seen catalytic converters fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, they're they can be they're expensive. not cheap. With, yeah, yeah. The labor's not usually bad. It's the it's the part. But the other thing, Dave, your car can be just running just fine, and you're slowly killing this thing. You know what about you go to the lube shop and oh that's that ah, four quarts of oil. They pump in four quarts of oil. 
you got to look it up. These cars sometimes only hold 3.2 quarts of oil. In a continuous overfilling that's sucking more oil and more, more vapors of the oil off the PCV system, and that's slowly killing that catalytic converter. It's just it's slow death. But then sometimes, and we can talk about this more, is the programming. You get the light on. There's no code that says you have a bad catalytic converter. There's sensors that are giving information. So we fix a lot of cars that people think they need a catalytic converter with programming the computer with a new update. Well, if you've got a catalytic converter question or any other question, don't hesitate to give us a call at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are helping you with your car. All you got to do to get involved is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, talking about catalytic converters. Dave, sounds like you found the sound effects button again. Somebody's, you're getting bored or something. Back you, in you've business. Been... <laughs> Do we have fact or fiction today? It's, it's coming up. No, not fact <laughs> okay. or fiction. So anyway, we are going to go with Stan, who is on the line in surprise. He's got a 2004 Chevrolet Impala. Go ahead, Stan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hello. Hi, Stan. What can we help you with today? Well, first of all, first off, I gave you information. It's a Malibu. Okay. <laughs> but I do have uh, three things that have been bugging me, and... Uh, uh, not been able to uh, come up with anything. First of all, <clears throat> does this car have a timing chain or timing belt? I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's going to have a timing chain on the Malibu, yes. Well, that's what I've been told, and again, I've been told it would be a timing belt, so that led to my confusion. Uh, my my current problem is, and it has been uh, ever since I had the car since 2004, and that is... Uh, it seems like uh, when I uh, take off, I take off my foot off, off the accelerator. I want to coast along. <clears throat> the car coasts along like it was, it, it, like it's a neutral. It doesn't have that engine to to slow it down. Well, that's that's probably normal. So we'll talk yeah. about that. But what then? What's the other thing that's bothering you? Oh, the other thing is, it's only in a in a cold uh, m- month of the uh, winter, and that is. <clears throat> I had a, no- a dreadful noise for, for about a mile coming out of the front of the engine. I took that to be uh, the tra- the transmission gave me a problem. I took it to the dealer. They checked it out and found nothing wrong with it. What I found out it to be is that the engine has that noise. If I rev up the engine, then the noise, the noise would increase. And uh, uh, it would still be, for about a mile, it would be very, quite quite noisy. Okay. It'd be howling and uh, uh, almost screaming. Okay, Stan. Well, there's t- a couple things that have to happen here first. And the one thing, when you when you go to the shop, they have to duplicate the noise. Unless they can duplicate the noise, the chances of them finding that problem and drilling down for you are, are pretty slim. Especially since it was a one-time shot. It only happened once. In the winter, it was cold. We can check some basic things, you know, fluid level, stuff like that. You know, I could see a power steering pump making noise mm-hmm. if it was low on fluid and it was cold. But, I mean, there's... Yeah, but, but if he, he, he has somehow uh, related that to the engine. So we might start by popping off, taking the belt off. And we're going to look at all the tensioners and idlers, maybe spin the alternator, spin, you know, turn the air conditioner, clutch and hub, see what we can power steering pump, see if there's some kind of bearing. You know, we, we might find something that's failing that could have been causing that noise. Maybe it, it does it when it's cold, but then as it warms up, it frees up a bit. So, the, again, the biggest thing we have to do is duplicate the noise, and then each shop will have a process to pinpoint that. And I think your coasting... Pr- Problem is not a problem. That's David can explain how the transmission works, but you don't want the engine loaded down. That is part of the emissions uh, programming and the strategy in the car. That's going to disconnect yeah. the engine from the transmission. On a front wheel drive GM, they are going to coast really well. I, you know, now when you come up, if you want them to engine brake when you're going at slower speeds, you literally manually have to move the shift lever. You can move it into two or one, but bad people don't, idea. Really, people no, don't no. really do that anymore. What that's do you mean, like, bad idea? Like, it's, it's there for a reason. Well. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? More and more cars, you put them in drive and it's an electronic switch. Right. And there's not even a connection really to the transmission by any linkage. I think that's 
that's uh what do you call it farm mentality <laughs> it's it's just it's it's you know it's not necessary now maybe if you're in a big truck and you're 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 towing a trailer and you want to well, Matt, Matt, Matt's talking out. I mean, it, it is necessary. So I'll give you an example because we've got to straighten this go. out. In a lot of transmissions, if you're going to pull a steep driveway at your house or you happen to live on one of those, when you pull the car into manual one or two, the transmission is actually stronger. It applies a band, and so it gives it more strength. It backs up a sprag. So there is a point to okay, it. Okay, we're going to get an online <laughs> argument here. But you talked about coming down the hill. Like, you're coming down Sunset Point. The last thing you need to be doing is going, all right, I have it in drive. Right, you no, know, you're not, you don't want to do that. No, engine, no. You're not That's the wrong time for that. Like, like that. But it's a function of the torque converter disconnecting, and it's normal as well. All right, Nitro, what else did Stan? have <laughs> that was it we covered it we're, we're good so i think well stan thank you so much for the call we are going to go with looks like chuck in scottsdale on a 2013 ford explorer go ahead chuck you're on bumper to bumper radio hey yeah uh, this is just an fyi for some of your listeners we bought the 2013 ford explorer um in december of last year and uh this past week we were pulling it in and out of the garage after uh, driving around and we started to smell a, a fuel smell, kind of a, a, a really strong gas smell in the garage. And so I called up um, the service guy at Ford yesterday, and he said that there's going to be an uh, actual recall on that on that model for in November, but not till November. He said it was kind of ironic, though. He said that um, it's okay to drive around until then, but I mean, it had a huge smell and it was leaking a little bit in the garage where you could see it was leaking fuel. And uh, I guess they were aware of it, but they wanted to recall it. I just didn't think it was safe to drive the thing around, like you said. Well, yeah, thanks for that info. I mean, it doesn't sound safe to me. That's one of those things where you get that odd answer. It's like, oh, yeah, that's normal. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, really? You don't want me to worry about this fuel leaking? <laughs> Come on. But I know the Ford Escapes, the late model Escapes, newer ones. I uh, read about a recall on those, and they said, don't even drive them. We will come tow them from your house. So I it wonder a, if that's the same. It was a big deal. Why wait to fix it? I mean, uh, great, there's a recall coming, but you know what? I'm driving this car. I just bought it, and you're telling me it's leaking fuel and don't worry about it? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not buying it. I'd be parking about 50 yards away from my house. Well, not in the garage for sure, but. Uh, well, it reminds me of the recall that came up with uh, Chrysler this week. I think it was this week. The government said, hey, you got to recall all these vehicles. Fuel tanks, not safe. And Chrysler said, ah, we don't think so. We're not recalling it. They didn't that, agree with them. That'll be an interesting battle. And their argument is, hey, they were built to the standard that was set forth when they were built. You can't come in and change the rules. I don't think there's been an overwhelming amount of uh, of issues with them. Maybe, you know, we don't see a lot of things here in Arizona that you might see in the Rust Belt or, or other parts of the country that are putting salt on the road. Maybe the fuel tank straps are or breaking or something like that and causing the tanks to fall out. I think this is more related to an accident issue. But uh, So those those uh, symptoms and recall things can be very regional, too. Well, what recalls as far as, you know, I think when I think of recalls, I think of safety issues. You know, people, a lot of times I'll call people and I'll say, hey, we've checked out your car and this is what's going on and we've seen this a lot with Volvo's. Uh, there's a programming fix for it. Or, and I'll be explaining a repair, and they'll say, oh, you see it a lot? Well, there must be a recall on it. No, there's no recall. Um, and one thing we refer to a lot is technical service bulletins. So will there be a technical service bulletin out about a certain problem? It's not something they recalled. All that the manufacturer is doing is saving time for people that are doing warranty work in their dealerships to know, hey, don't spend all this time looking for this. This is what it is. This is what we found to fix it. Try this first. But we've also, we talked about the catalytic converters. Code 420 on the Toyotas all the time. That's the code. You need a catalytic converter. You need a converter. Well, there's programming updates, and people think, whoa, that must be a recall. No, it's just new information. They've opened the window, so to speak. They've lightened the parameters. They've released a new program, kind of like your Windows update, and we can do that in the shop. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are talking about your car. Any questions you might have, 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. Peter is working the knobs a little bit different today. We're jamming today. we got some tunes rolling this time, you know? It's... Uh it can can car repair be exciting? It can be. Yeah. It can be, and it, it can be, and oftentimes it's very aggravating and and difficult. So, uh, you know, 
be nice and smile and, and treat your technician, your automotive mechanic and technician, very nice because uh, you're going to need them someday, right, Dave? For sure. <laughs> well, up first this segment, we're going to go with Eric in Peoria on a 2003 Acura. Go ahead, Eric. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. How are we doing, guys? Thanks for taking my call. First time call. Um, I have a 2003 Acura, as you said. Um, I got the radiator and thermostat replaced about two weeks ago it just went on the uh i got it replaced brake masters everything was fine um about a week ago um i drive 500 miles a week about 125 miles a day and if the car sits for over five minutes it starts to heat up only when the air conditioner is on though it feels like i'm not a big car person but i know enough when there's you know something wrong it feels that if the air conditioner is doing too much for the car and all of a sudden it'll heat up and i noticed it because the air starts to blow out not as cold as it heats up okay eric when you say it went out what does that mean it went out i mean did the radio go on a date did it did it where did it where did it go what happened this way put it this way if it went on a date it would have only been cheaper than where 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 we ended up um basically it went out as in they said there was a crack along the seam and um i was driving i heard this hissing sound i'm not from arizona so i um i don't know my way around too much and i pull over and i'm looking at everything i'm like oh well i don't i don't see anything well there was smoke coming not out of the radiator but it, I thought something, I might have broke a hose or something. I was hoping that I broke a hose, but unfortunately, okay. no. What? And I, I yeah. think I got it. This this is probably a classic example of the two-step process. We need to fix what broke, and then we need to find out what caused it to happen. So what you probably saw was steam, not smoke, and the radiator, sounds like the radiator tank cracked. They're plastic tanks. It's not uncommon. Car's 10 years old. Yeah. So what the shop did is they fixed the, the, the symptom or what, what, what ended up breaking. And I suspect that besides some age, the car started running hot and building a high temperature, which equals high pressure, and cracked that radiator tank. But what you said is when the car pulls, when, you, when you're in traffic, it heats up and the air conditioner doesn't work as well as what I, as what I understood. There are probably on that car two, maybe just one electronic cooling fans. Those fans do two things. They're going to come on and off as the computer tells them to, to cool the engine. They might turn on at 230 degrees and shut back off at a, at 206 or whatever is pre-programmed. Those in. are terrible numbers. <laughs> you don't know, Dave. <laughs> so, the, um, and then the second thing that that may be one fan doing that. And there may be two fans. One comes on and off normal, but when you turn the air conditioner on, both fans are going to come on all the time, more likely, or the single fan will come will stay on. So when you're driving down the road, you're moving air over the radiator in the air conditioning condenser, which is what the fans are supposed to be doing. That's normal. That's that's cooling. It's taking heat out of the out of the out of the car. But when you stop, there's no airflow. So I suspect what you have is fans, radiator fans that are not working. So you need to. I would find a good all round general repair shop i don't think the shop you went to did anything wrong they just didn't know to go far enough there was an additional repair that needed to be made so i'm gonna i'm gonna throw something else at you the radio could have just broke because it just broke because of age it's 10 years old he's new to the valley car's not used to the heat it breaks sometimes there's a little bit of damage done maybe a head gasket was damaged so it could be there's more steps that need to happen as this car as this car gets diagnosed. And that's the one thing I can, can't can tell you enough is don't ever let your car overheat. You know, you don't want, if you got hoses on there, they're a decade old, get new hoses. Yeah, that and that was the other, you know, other thing. When you're doing the radiator, now you have to start to wonder what else goes along with that repair to make this thing complete and long-lasting. Radiator hoses, they're half off when you're doing the radiator. It's really easy to put new ones on. Uh, the thermostat got replaced. You had the whole hose all the way off. At that point, all you're buying is a radiator hose. So think about that and, and make sure you ask those questions with your shop is what else can we do to make this a better, longer la- lasting repair and talk about you know, how you're going to be using the car. So, Well, th- thanks so much for the call, Eric. We are going to go with Jason in Glendale on a 2003 Expedition. Go ahead, Jason. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, man. How you doing? Good. 
Hey, uh, two two issues I want to address or ask about with my car, my truck. Uh, the check engine light came on. The code is through. I don't know the numbers offhand, but uh, it said it was running lean in both banks. That's number one. The second issue is with my air conditioner. Um, when I'm giving it gas, the, the air conditioner doesn't come out the front uh, vent. It goes up towards the windshield like a defrost. But when I let go of the gas or hit the brake pretty hard, the air conditioner, the air starts coming out of the vent out of the dash, you know, aiming towards your face. So I don't know if it's, I don't know if that little door is stuck in there and when I'm hitting the brake, it opens and closes or what the deal is. The so, transmission okay. guy wants to tell you what's happening here. Right, right, because because the, the general repair guy knows everything today. <laughs> so he needs to be he needs to be settled down. But as far as the air conditioning goes, when you when you accelerate, the engine produces less vacuum. And there's going to be a vacuum-controlled, uh, not blend door, but mode door on that dashboard. So more than likely, I would say we've got a vacuum leak or a check va- vacuum check valve. And the fact that when you hit the brakes, it changes. The brake booster also is a, something that uses vacuum. How would I do, Matt? You did all right, considering that the lean fuel condition, which was probably a PO 171 or 174, is probably ah. a vacuum. It's probably a vacuum leak as well. So your two symptoms are very likely the same problem. The reason the check engine light's probably coming on, there's an engine vacuum leak. It's allowing unmetered air to get into the engine. And when I say unmetered, it's not passing through the air filter and going over the mass airflow sensor. So the computer can't calculate the volume of air that's going in there and to adjust for the proper fuel. So it's not giving enough fuel for the volume of air it recognizes that turns on that light. That same reason that the check engine light is coming on is probably your air conditioning control problem as well. Well, Jason, thank you so much for the call. We are going to go with Linda in Mesa. looks like she's got a 2006 Chevrolet Impala. Go ahead, Linda. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I have an 06 Chevy Impala, and when I'm running the air conditioner or anything, um, if you change it from like the defrost setting down to the floor or a mixture, you know, of the two, uh, you get this really loud banging like you have a flat tire right behind the glove compartment. And I haven't taken it in to have it looked at or anything yet. If you, It'll go away after about five minutes, but in the meantime, everybody around you thinks you're extremely crazy. Mm. <laughs> everybody in the car or is it is oh no it's loud enough everybody outside hears it too i've pulled over when it happened the very first time and pulled into a parking lot and when you get out of the car it's just as loud i mean it's well my, wow. my, my first reaction is hey we've got it we've got a it's a mode door uh that operates between you know defrost and the floor and the vents in the middle uh we got a mode door that may be going bad but the the hearing the noise is way outside the car you know well, you, me for yeah, I was. I mean, what I was about to say is the same thing as Dave. I was thinking of the electronic version of what Jason's problem was on the the mechanical or the vacuum controlled system. So if it's making it outside the car now, this is with the engine running and the air conditioner on, correct? Yes, and especially like out here. Um, I'm from Nebraska. Brought the car out here. <laughs> when I use the remote start, um, it you know turns the air conditioning on like at full blast. And so when you get in it, it's hopefully cool. But then the minute you turn, put the key in it and turn it, and it cycles itself down, um, that noise happens as well. Are you sure you can hear this outside the car? Because this symptom that you're telling me, I had the exact same thing on an Impala with the remote start. So you can really stand outside the car with the engine idling, and this is loud enough where where a, a pedestrian would be looking at you. Um, or so, like a vehicle parked right next to you in the parking lot. It's not traveling a great distance, but it's you can hear it outside the car. Uh, okay. I, I still think you have a control problem because I can't remember exactly what the deal was with the remote start, Dave, on this Impala that we had, but... It, try going from the maximum setting to not quite max. Just go one tick up and see if the noise goes away. And you might have it on. You might have dual control for the driver and the passenger mm-hmm. side. But there was. I just can't remember exactly. But when you start the car remotely, you're not obviously not turning on the ignition switch, and the air conditioner controller is not getting the the the, the ignition switch cycle and there there was something goofy about that. I bet you have a, a, a mode door or blend door actuator problem. 
and and maybe it's not i'm i'm thinking it's loud like there's something clanking clanking and making noise of the speed of the engine outside the car i'm kind of thinking that's not the case and i've changed my mind back to my original thought because of the remote start deal so if you need a shop go to bumper to bumper radio.com there are several guys in mesa depending on where you are the gilbert area the the borders you know i get a little goofy out there in mesa i don't know my way around but i know there's we've got a handful of great shops at bumper to bumper radio.com that can help you and uh, i know they'll solve the issue well that brings us to the email of the week from joel g he's got a 2002 honda civic and he went to one shop and uh, it turns out he needs lower control arm bushings. The first shop he talked to said, hey, we can replace your control arms. It's going to be $750. He said, hmm, you know, maybe I'll go get a different price. So he actually, in this case, he went to the dealer, and the dealer said, oh, we don't replace the whole control arm. We just press in new bushings. Mm -hmm. You know, which one would you do, Dave? You know, so. Well, there's a lot that goes into that answer. I mean, it, it depends on the car, so we're gonna have to look at how does that con- how is that control arm serviced? Do we want to just push press bushings in? Dave and I looked this up yesterday on this particular Honda. When you buy the control arm, you're getting new bushings, but the only other thing you're getting is a big heavy chunk of steel. That's all. Yeah, you're getting it. But let's say if there was if there was damage to a control arm or the, where the bushings went bad and it damaged the seats where the bushings sit, you may want to consider it if if you're looking at it. Now the guy that got the second phone call. You know, that could have been on the phone. Was he looking at it? So there's more that plays into it. But in that particular car, there's no advantage. Now, in some cars, you're getting a ball joint with a control arm. So I've got a bushing that's worn out at 100,000 miles. I've also got a ball joint that's got 100,000 miles on it. So if the control arm comes with a ball joint, hey. That's the classic example we see at my shop all the time, BMW. The bushings, the front control arm bushings break all the time, 40, 50,000 miles. On those, we're going to press a new bushing into that control arm. 130,000 miles, it's a little bit more money, but guess what? That new control arm, ha- or the, the, if you buy a new control arm, it has the bushing in it. The new control arm is the ball joint. So if you spend the money putting the bushing in the ball joint, and then you're back 10,000 miles later, or putting the bushing in, and then you're back 10,000 miles later with the ball joint, you've got, the, you've got to re- waste all of the things that we just did. Well, that's always my classic point. I've got you know, I've got five different mechanics. I've got four different answers, and three of them is right. So what we're trying to do is help you understand what you're getting from the mechanics, why you're getting different answers, and that was his question. Which way do I go? So when we come back, 602-277-5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. All right, Dave and I are having a fist fight here in the studio during the break. We get an <laughs> argument going I'm Matt Allen, he's Dave Riccio, this is Bumper to Bumper Radio, and we're here to help you with your car. And so much so that Dave and I are having a throw <laughs> down in the studio arguing about Eric's car with the Acura a little bit, and uh, started vetting that out a little bit more and talking about it. And Dave, you have some more ideas that I didn't think about, and then I even thought of another one. But this is how auto repair goes. This is a thought process. You've got to get this thing out. It's not at. It's not easy. There's a lot of things that come into play. And one of the things that comes into play, like on Eric's car that I was talking about, is, hey, we just had a radiator put in. It is possible that the system didn't get bled all the way. You know, it functions pretty good. It's, when I say bled, there's air pocket maybe in the system. It Cooling system. It works pretty good, but now we're to stop. The car's sitting. It's not working as well as it could. But I wasn't sure if he was referring to the air condition was warming up when the car sat or the vehicle was actually warming up when the car sat. So that could go either way. And the other thing that then I started thinking about is what we should have asked Eric was, did you have the same symptom preceding your radiator repair? And if you did... Well, then maybe this is the cause and effect situation. And just as well as Dave said, there might be an air pocket, which is a common problem on Hondas and Acura's. If you don't bleed them out right, we didn't even think about that at the time. But it could. I did, by the way. Yeah, it could. You didn't say anything about it. Here we are going to start going at it again. I'm taking these headphones off. We're going to start hearing some rust here. We're going for it. But maybe the shop just forgot to plug in the fans now. Right. So that that could be the other thing. So. Well, we're going to go with Peter in Phoenix. Looks like a 2009 Ford Crown Victoria. Go ahead, Peter. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. You're doing a good job. Uh, What I've got is the 2009 Police Interceptor Crown Vic. 
or I've got a 2007 also police interceptor Crown Vic, and what I'm trying to decide is of the two, now the newer one has more miles, about 50,000, it's about 150, the older one's right around 100, and is it just dumb to go with the newer one with the older miles, or is that the smart route to go? So you're picking, you're, you're going you're gonna to buy one or the other or keep one or the other. You're trying to decide which one you want to keep. Right. I'm going to buy one or the other. Well, Dave, this, this comes up to our topic that we have in a couple of weeks with Jason from Lab One. You, you want to know mm. what to do? We pull an oil sample off the car. Pull several oil samples. We're going to take two ounces of engine oil, take two ounces of transmission fluid, pull some oil out of the, di- out of the rear differential of each vehicle, and send that out for analysis. So you're going to want to listen up to, to what I, when is that, Dave? June 16th? I, I don't know, a yeah, couple weeks. I'm terrible weeks. with dates, but it's going to be an interesting uh, show. But So they, they, at the, Dave and I went and saw this lab uh, downtown, and they're going to sample the oil. They're going to look for contaminants, fuel, all the different metals, that, which might be an indicator of ring damage or bearing damage, uh, clutch material in the transmission. These guys are I like mean, the CSI of fluid, and it's amazing what you can know from a fluid sample. So, like, literally, keep your calendar mark. We'll find out next week. We'll get back to you on a date. But uh, a fluid sample could help you decide. I'm not scared of the older car because they're pretty close in model year. You know, if we're talking about 10 years model year difference, yeah, I would take the newer one. But in this case, I would probably, me, I tend to favor, I don't know enough about them as far as was there much difference in engine. I think they're pretty much the same. I would go with the one with 100,000 miles. In, in other words, it's got, you know, 30% less use on it. But what's wrapped around it, too, and you don't know how hard those miles are. Who knows? Maybe the car was in an accident. But send us an email at bumper to bumperradiocom Go to the contact page, and we can maybe get you a referral down to, to Lab 1, so that you can go down there, you have to buy the sample bottles, and they'll do the analysis and uh, maybe help you make a decision. Well, thanks so much for the call. We're going to go with James in Phoenix on a 1991 Ford Explorer. Go ahead, James. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, I uh, have a question for Dave. Uh, I've got a 91 Ford Explorer and uh, automatic transmission, and I was going down the freeway, and I turned off on the exit road, and when I got to the stop sign, I had no gears at all. No, no. Rear, rear reverse or nothing. Is this a two-wheel drive or a four-wheel drive? It's a two-wheel drive. A two-wheel drive. Everything went away altogether. How many miles are on your 91 Explorer? About 100,000. James, did you call us on this a couple weeks ago? Yes, I did. And Dave was a uh, I guess it'd be case cleaning or something. That. Yeah, did you? Now, you had serviced this transmission yourself for just maintenance. You didn't have any other problems, if I remember correctly. And right. then this happened a short time later. So, did you ever pull the pan off to see if the filter had fallen down? Yes, I pulled it back off and checked all of that. And I also put a new modulator on it. And uh, <clears throat> there's uh, nothing wrong with uh, in that pan that I could see. There's no metal filing. Or nothing. If it was me, what I would do is I would take a t- transmission cooler line loose at the radiator, take it off, start the engine, and see if any pl- fluid comes squirting out of it. If I got no fluid comes squirting out of it, I got a pump issue. So it's weird to have no forward and no reverse. That's why I asked if it was two wheel drive or four wheel drive because sometimes we'll have a transfer case act up. But uh, that would be what I would be checking for next is pump pressure. So yeah. hopefully that helps. And appreciate the phone call. We're going to squeeze one more in here. Let's go with, looks like, Jesse in Mesa on a K5 Blazer. Jesse, but before you go real quick, I just want to remind everybody else that's holding, Dave and I always stay after the show. We answer every single question. It won't be on the air, but we'll take your call and we'll help you out. So go ahead, Jesse. Yes, I have a 87 Chevy Blazer with uh, engine problems. I just replaced the pickup coil, uh, all kinds of electrical problems with it. And I replaced a lot of stuff, and it still sputters, stop and go, stop and go, and then it shuts off. How could I repair that? I, what, what would you recommend to fix it? So what have you done? Well, first off, what was happening, and then what have you done, and then did anything that you did to attempt to repair this help or change the problem? Well, it was running all right, and then all of a sudden uh, I thought there was an injector problem, so I replaced the injectors both of them, and then it, I thought it was an electronic fuel pump, so I replaced the pump, I replaced, I replaced the wiring, replaced the uh, spark plugs, 
replace the rotor, replace the cap, all kinds of stuff, and it's still the same problem, so, stopping those, those. Okay. Well, I mean, the 87 vehicle, I mean, that that's just, that's, I mean, you've covered just about everything that's easy, all the bolt-on stuff, and and I, I don't, I mean, you could have a mechanical problem causing a sputtering, a broken valve, valve, uh, valve spring, you could have an intake manifold gasket leak. You didn't mention doing a distributor cap or a rotor or anything like that. That could, that could certainly be a problem. Uh, on you could have a uh, fuel pressure regulator that's got a ruptured diaphragm and is sucking raw fuel into the car. I mean, there's a number of different things, and I think you've done so much now that uh, you you need to get it to a shop that can actually look at the car. There's no way we're going to solve that one over the radio. Just it's just not going to happen. That's going to need to get to a shop where somebody that's experienced can look at that sort it all out, make sure the basics are happening, and then logically go through step-by-step step and figure it out. Well, Scott and Alex, go ahead and hang on the line. We're going to get to you here just after the show close. We appreciate you sharing your Saturday with us. We hope you enjoy the lovely 108 degrees. He is Matt Allen. I am Dave Riccio. If you have a guy who takes care of your car, stick with him. If you're looking for a guy, you've got to have a guy or gal relationship to take care of your vehicles. Bumper to bumper radio.com. There's a list of great shops there. If you need a personal referral, go ahead and send us an email. Thanks, Peter, and we'll be back next week.